Welcome to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka, and it is May the 18th, 2020. Mayo Clinic has been a leader in developing and deploying testing for COVID-19. But understanding the array of these tests, what each of them are for and what they measure and when they should be used can be confusing at best. Terms like viral, molecular, serology, and antibodies aren't clear for everyone. So when do we use the different tests for COVID-19? Here to help us understand this question today is Dr. Bobby Pritt. Dr. Pritt is the Chair of the Division of Clinical Microbiology at the Mayo Clinic. Thanks for being with us today, Dr. Pritt. It's my pleasure, Helena. Thank you for inviting me. It's wonderful to have you here. I think it is so confusing because we are hearing in the news all the time about this new test and that new test, and some of them take a long time and some of them don't take very long. And I think um, the public, uh, many of us have no idea when to order what test or, or which one, um, what they mean. So sure. thanks for being here. Could you help us to understand, first of all, the two basic types of tests? a swab test that's diagnostic, and a blood test for antibodies. What, what are those tests for? I would be happy to. So as you mentioned, we could break this down simply into two types of widely available tests at this time. So the swab test, which collects a specimen from your nose or throat, detects the virus itself. More specifically, it detects the virus's genetic material called RNA. Because it's detecting the virus itself, that will answer the question of whether or not you're currently infected. So this, would te this test would be appropriate if you're currently experiencing signs and symptoms of COVID-19 like fever and chills, body ache, dry cough, loss of smell. So that's the swab test. Now, in contrast, the blood test is completely different. It detects something called antibodies, and these are proteins your body forms one to two weeks after you've been exposed to the virus. And antibodies are part of your body's defense system against the virus. So when you have those and they're detectable, that means that you've been previously infected. So they're really answering two different types of questions here, whether you're infected now or whether you've been infected in the past. And how long do the results for each of those type of tests take? Well, it depends on the laboratory in which testing is performed and if the specimen needs to be shipped to the laboratory. So if the specimen is just going to your local laboratory, then results could be available in just a few hours, or it could take a day or two. But obviously it's gonna take a little longer if the specimen has to go further away. How do I know if I need to have one of these tests? It's best to speak with your provider to determine whether or not you should be tested. And if there's a phone line for testing at your local healthcare facility, you can also call that line for more guidance. So if I test positive uh, for COVID-19, Dr. Pritt, then what happens? Do I have to go to the clinic to see my physician? Do I have to um, be hospitalized? What, what happens next? Good question. You'll want to get advice from your healthcare provider. Fortunately, most people can recover safely at home, but you'll want to quarantine yourself and stay away from others so that you don't spread infection to them. And it's important to note that health officials may also conduct something called contact tracing, in which they try to determine who you might have come into contact with while you were infectious to others. But during the time that you're at home and you're sick, you'll want to take good care of yourself, get enough rest, and of course, stay well hydrated. And importantly, if you start experiencing any extremely troublesome symptoms, such as difficulty breathing, then you'll want to call your healthcare provider right away or maybe even go to the emergency room. So if I test positive, but then I successfully recover from COVID-19, I'm feeling better, ready to go back to work. Do I need to be tested again, or do I need to have the antibody testing at that point? Not necessarily. You'll want to discuss this with employee health, if that is available, or talk to your own physician and get advice. But at this time, we don't know exactly what the significance of having antibodies means, and therefore, it's not a test that we're recommending everyone get. We know that antibodies provide protection from the virus, at least some extent of protection, but we don't know how long the antibodies will last, and we don't know if they'll prevent someone from becoming infected again. So unfortunately, they can't be used as that magic test to let someone go back to work. You still would want to take precautions such as wearing a mask, staying six feet away from others, washing your hands, and also following any rules that your employer may have. 
it doesn't seem like there are any easy answers to this. <laughs> it's very <laughs> true. Yeah. When is it important to use antibody testing and for whom? Yeah, well, let's start by first just saying what antibodies are. Antibodies are proteins that are formed by your body's immune system. So they're part of your body's response to infectious threats, such as viruses and bacteria. And the antibodies help fight infections. And so you can protect yourself from future infections with these antibodies. When you have antibodies to a virus, such as the COVID-19 virus, then that does mean that you've been infected in the past and your body has responded successfully to the infection. But unfortunately, as we just mentioned, we don't know how long those antibodies will last and we don't know how protective they are. So at this point, the main use of antibody testing is to determine how many people in a population has been infected. That would be helpful for just uh, epidemiology and community health, but also to possibly identify people who can donate their plasma to help others fight COVID-19. Oh, that's really interesting, the connection between um, those treatments that we hear about and, and the testing that's going on as well. Exactly. You know, uh, when, when people talk about testing, we hear the terms sometimes like false positive, false negative. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us um, what those mean and why it matters? Yeah, let's talk about uh, false negatives. That's something that people are really concerned about. Um, a false negative result is when you're actually positive, but the test gives you a negative result. So for example, if you had COVID-19, you were feeling sick, you had a fever, and you went and got tested with the nasal swab method, but the result was negative, then we would call that a false negative because you were actually positive. Now, the opposite would be if you weren't sick at all and you were tested and you had a positive result, that would be a false positive where you didn't actually have the infection, but the test told you you did. So it's important to remember that no test is perfect. There's always a chance of getting a false negative or a false positive result. And some tests are more likely to produce false negatives than others. Um, also, the type of specimen that's tested is important and how well the specimen is collected. So right now, the best specimen we have to detect active infection is a swab that is obtained through your nose and it goes deep back into your throat. That's called a nasal pharyngeal swab. So a nasal pharyngeal swab that's collected by a highly trained and experienced healthcare worker and then tested by a highly sensitive test at a high quality laboratory is least likely to produce these erroneous false negative and false positive results. Isn't that interesting? Because I think that uh, most of us would think that all tests are created equal. In other words, yeah. you know, if I go get a test um, in New York for COVID or I go get one in California, that, that they're the same test, but that's maybe not true. Yes, and also the different types of specimens that are collected may be better at detecting viruses than others. So for example, a specimen that is collected just from the front part of your nose or from your throat is less likely to have the virus in it and therefore more likely to produce a false negative result than that really deep nasal pharyngeal swab. So that's why that's the gold standard specimen for testing with the swab test. Well, how do I know if the test that I'm getting is accurate? Yeah, good question. As I mentioned before, there's no perfect test with 100% accuracy. But if you get tested from a healthcare system that you trust, where the test is performed by a high quality laboratory and the specimen was collected by highly trained and experienced healthcare providers, then you can feel confident with that result. As I mentioned though, Given that no test is perfect, if your result is negative and you continue to feel sick, you should always feel free to call your healthcare provider and talk to that person and see if you should be tested again or maybe even receive a different type of test. Dr. Pritt, tell us a little bit about um, what preventative measures that I can take, um, assuming I've had a COVID test and I'm waiting for the result, or even if I haven't had to have one yet, what, what sort of recommendations do you give? Sure. Well, regardless of whether you've been tested or not, you're going to want to take steps to protect yourself and others during the COVID-19 pandemic. And that would mean things such as washing your hands frequently, maintaining social distance, which is a 
about six feet apart from others, wearing a mask when that is indicated to do so, and staying home when you're able. Uh, you'll want to follow the guidelines as presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, and also your employer and local government. And then, of course, if you've received a test, you'll want to follow up on those test results. And if you don't receive them, then you'll want to call your provider and have those results relayed to you. Thanks so much, Dr. Pritt, for being with us. I think this has been exceptionally helpful in clarifying testing. Sounds like there's an awful lot that goes into it, more than um, many of us probably understood. Thanks so much uh, for joining us. This has been uh, Mayo Clinic Q&A with Dr. Bobby Pritt today. She's the chair of the um, Division of Clinical Microbiology at Mayo Clinic. Thanks for joining us on Mayo Clinic Q&A. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all the Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.